We are a nation hooked on pills and medicinal quick fixes. Our health service spends billions of pounds on drugs that we might not need. But the last decade has seen a surge of research into an alternative approach to health, the use of food as medicine. Now these studies from around the world will be shared with the public by the Food Hospital. The first of its kind, it's dedicated to combating illness through food. Pioneering this approach are three medical professionals with 40 years of NHS experience between them. I passionately believe in the science of food as medicine and I want the public to know about it. They want us to stop reaching for the drugs. When we get ill, we think it's much easier to pop a pill than it is to alter our lifestyle. It's time to change that thinking. And start eating our way back to health. Each year I operate on hundreds of patients who are ill through poor diet. But food isn't the enemy. It could even be the cure. Over three months, the food hospital will treat patients with conditions ranging from high cholesterol to cancer and from infertility to eczema without prescribing a single drug. The NHS spends over £12 billion on medicines each year, but the food hospital will explore the role food can play by treating all kinds of illnesses with a plan uniquely tailored for each patient. A young boy living in the shadow of crippling migraines. What's this one here? I want to be killed. A man in denial about the consequences of type 2 diabetes. Once you've got that, it is irreversible and identical twins on the front line of breast cancer who are using food to try and fight it. Saturated fat might have an impact on breast cancer risk. But the food hospital does much more than treat patients. It wants to help the health of the whole country. Dr Pixie McKenna will unearth the truth about the things that claim to be good for us. Is the term superfood merely a marketing ploy or is there any truth behind it? First through the doors is a young woman who's got cysts on her ovaries. My name's Lauren Rogerson hoadley I'm 24, from Middlesex. Lauren has polycystic ovary syndrome, which affects one in 10 British women. Signs you might have PCOS include putting on weight, acne, problem periods, difficulty conceiving and excess hair growth. It affects me in many ways, my confidence being the main one. Lauren's symptoms started to show when she was 15, which made her a target for her teenage classmates. They used to like call me sideburns, the girl with a beard, you know, um, whiskers, beardy face, that sort of stuff. And it, it hurt, it really hurt. So I just had to kind of hope that they'd stop. But they didn't, they carried on doing it. Now weighing 19 stone, Lauren lacks the confidence to find a job and has become a virtual recluse. It's on my mind all the time, you know, are people looking at me? Do they realise that I've got a condition or do they think I'm just weird? Lauren doesn't like taking drugs and hasn't been to the doctor for six years. So now she wants to find a new way to fight her illness. It would mean so much to be able to manage my condition through my diet. Like all food hospital patients, Lauren has been given a series of blood tests to give the team a fully rounded picture of her health. Do you want to step up? She is being seen by GP Gio Meletto, who wants to start by showing her the root cause of PCOS. Here is a picture of a polycystic ovary, and you can see bulging out here is one of the cysts on the edge of the ovary that you typically see them. Another one here, another one here, one down here. Found in the pelvis, the ovaries are about the size of almonds and produce eggs. Every menstrual cycle, the ovary develops several follicles. Of these, just one will release an egg. This is called ovulation. Women with Lauren's condition have many more of these follicles, but none of them release an egg. Instead, they turn into fluid-filled cysts. One of the reasons for this is too much of the male hormone testosterone, which sometimes is caused by diet. Let's look at here at your testosterone level. You'd normally expect it to be no more than about 1.8 in a woman. 
Here, yours is seven. Mm. So that's actually really quite high. Yeah. Can we have a look at your armpit? I was told that it had discoloration when I was yeah, diagnosed. Yeah, so this here can be something associated with PCOS called acanthosis nigrans, and it's the pigmentation of the skin that is associated with raised insulin levels. Can we have a look at the back here? Yeah. Do you mind if we lower? Yeah, you've got these pustules, that's a good one there, mm -hmm. and these blackheads here that are features of acne. Let's take a look at the uh, front here of your belly. Yeah. Yeah, OK. And I'm kind of assuming that excess hair growth goes downwards as well. Yeah, and I get it up here as well, little patches. So you've got some on your chest. It grows on the top of my breasts as well. I hate it. I don't feel very feminine having to shave my face. It's, it's a nightmare. I don't like it. I hate having to do it. But there's another reason Lauren worries about having PCOS. It can affect your fertility. Yeah, she's got a boyfriend now that uh, she's found after 13 years, and they're, they're very happy. And I'm hoping that they'll have a family together, which would be really nice, because they talk a lot about it as well. I've known that I wanted to be a mum since I was 10. So hopefully someday that'll get fulfilled. <laughs> to see how bad the cysts on Lauren's ovaries are, Gio has arranged a transvaginal scan at the food hospital. Lauren, this is your left ovary here. The little black areas being the little eggs or cysts around the outside of the ovary. Do you have a regular cycle? It varies, but I can have one and then skip two or three months and then have another one. Polycystic ovary syndrome is associated with subfertility because women don't have a regular cycle where they're ovulating and therefore mm -hmm. pregnancy essentially becomes impossible until mm -hmm. that's been addressed. It's my life dream to be a mum. OK. So it would be really, really gutting if that was snatched away from me. After Lauren's consultation, she sees dietitian Lucy Jones. She wants Lauren to change the way she eats, as her current diet consists of white bread, sausages and crisps. This has given her high insulin levels. Now, having too high insulin levels in our blood actually affects those hormones which are causing your symptoms. Mm. And it's namely testosterone, really. Yeah. <laughs> so when there's too much insulin running in your blood, it actually increases testosterone production in the ovaries. And it also stops your body from clearing the testosterone. There is no cure for PCOS, but Lucy wants to start Lauren on a hormone balancing food plan to try and lower her insulin levels. If it works, it could improve her irregular periods, her weight, and possibly over time, even her hair growth. And if her high testosterone is principally caused by diet, that might improve too. Lauren's new plan will be made up of pulses, vegetables and whole grain foods. It's a big change for Lauren, so Lucy's showing her the ropes with a hormone-friendly pizza. Eating whole grain bread instead of white will burn energy more slowly, making less insulin in the body. These are mini pita breads, but they're seeded and they've got lots of different cereal grains in. Upping the vegetables on your plate to 50% increases vitamin intake and helps with weight loss. What we've got here is some roasted vegetables. So these have been in the oven for about 25 minutes. Mix these with some chickpeas. And adding pulses like chickpeas instead of fatty or processed meats is good for your protein levels. That looks really nice. <laughs> ah, wait till you try it. Lauren will leave with a plan of hormone balancing foods and recipes, which she will follow at home before returning to see Lucy and Gio in 12 weeks' time. So I'm hoping by strictly following our hormone balancing diet, mm -hmm. getting in some regular exercise, that's going to make a really big difference to the symptoms that you're suffering as part of your polycystic ovary syndrome. I feel um, really confident about what I've learned today, all the new information and things I can take home and put into practice. And uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm Dr Pixie McKenna, and each week the food hospital will be sending me to investigate the stories surrounding the food we eat. Today I'm going to unearth the truth about a real headline grabber, superfoods. What exactly is a superfood? Is the term merely a marketing ploy, or is there any truth behind it? We all know the name. We spend millions of pounds a year on acai berries, green tea, blueberries and Brazil nuts. But what do we consumers actually think it means. Superfoods I know nothing about. Fruits you've never heard of before that um, are supposed to have some special properties that don't belong to things like cucumbers and apples. 
kind of like a, a supplement but a natural version. I would be willing to pay more for something knowing that it's better for me. Like the acai berry, I think it is. Um, that makes weight loss happen. Companies will do whatever it takes to make sales. I don't think I'd even look at a superfood. I'm super enough. <laughs> In fact, the name is a marketing invention, so I'm meeting a PR expert to find out why food companies value this term so highly. What is your definition of a superfood? Well, a superfood is a food, usually a fruit or a vegetable product, that is thought to deliver specific health benefits. So, for example, the blueberry is thought to be a superfood because it contains fibre, antioxidants, vitamin C and other ingredients that are thought to make it very, very good for your health. Then, according to marketing definitions, new potatoes should qualify as a superfood. A standard 200 gram portion provides significantly more vitamin C, zinc, magnesium and fibre than a standard 80 gram portion of much more expensive blueberries. The term superfood, it's a PR gift, isn't it? Food companies are always looking for new ways to give their products a point of difference over their competitors. So being able to associate a medicinal benefit with a specific type of food is a powerful tool. I think that lots of food companies have used scientific language in order to sell a product to consumers. But is this scientific language actually based on fact? Later, I become a human guinea pig in my quest to find out if the top-selling superfood really does have a magic ingredient that makes it different from ordinary foods. The Food Hospital has worked with over 250 experts and research bodies to bring you some of the latest findings on food as medicine. Our team of medical professionals, GP Gio Meletto, consultant surgeon Shaw Summers, and dietitian Lucy Jones are on the front line of the food as medicine revolution. Can food replace drugs? In many cases, yes, and we're going to prove it. Next at the food hospital, a little boy with a frightening illness, which according to some research could affect up to one in ten children. My name's Louise, this is Harvey. Harvey's seven years old and he suffers from migraines. The other night, Harvey was rolling around on his bed shouting, help me, help me. Migraine is the biggest neurological condition in the developed world. As well as agonizing headaches, other symptoms can include vomiting, vision distortion, mood or personality changes, or difficulty walking or talking. If your child has any of these symptoms, you should contact your doctor. Harvey started getting severe headaches at the age of four, so his GP sent him for tests. They ruled everything else out, like brain tumour and epilepsy. Um, so they just put it down to migraines and started him on his medication. Harvey is prescribed drugs for his headaches, but they've gradually become less and less effective. He's had three this week, so probably two out of the three have been really bad ones. He goes really pale. He has to go to bed. Um, sometimes he can't use his legs. He says he feels wobbly. His migraines are so painful, he struggles to tell his mum how he feels. When he's been upset sometimes, he's been drawing his pictures. Um, he's, like, got his head chopped off in some of them. It's devastating for any mum to hear your seven-year-old child shouldn't be thinking like that. They should be thinking about playing football, not about wanting to go and stab themselves. Desperate to help Harvey enjoy a normal childhood, Louise has come to see Dr Gio Meletto. You are... Harvey. And Louise? Yes. Uh, Harvey's got migraines, is that right? Yes. And where does he get the headache? You show where you get it right in the middle, don't you? On the top, yeah. Yeah. And what's it like? Is it like a banging or...? It's twisting. Yeah, he says like his brain twists inside his head. Some can last most of the day, if not two days. Two days? Yeah. That's a long time. You don't know exactly what causes migraine. Well, recently we've started to understand that actually it's to do with the way the brain functions and the neurons fire and that sets off some kind of a reaction that causes these symptoms of the headache, the nausea, and the neurological features as well. Harvey, I've got some drawings here that you've done. What's this one here? I want to be killed. I want to be killed? When did you draw that? Yeah. That must be quite upsetting. Yeah, 
Yeah, it was. With children, it can be quite difficult to ask direct questions about their condition. So you have to find more indirect methods to try and understand how they feel about something. And drawings are a really good way to demonstrate that, as Harvey's shown us. At the moment, all Louise can do is manage her son's migraines as they happen. But Gio wants to try and prevent him getting them in the first place. New research suggests that a seemingly random group of everyday foods all contain compounds called amines, which may cause migraines or headaches. So dietitian Lucy Jones wants Harvey to cut them out. The diet that we're going to put Harvey on, we've taken out things like full fat milk and he's actually going to have skimmed milk. We'll make sure that we're giving you all those nutrients in terms of fat in other bits of your diet. Okay. Other things that you need to be careful of is citrus fruits. Right. So, no oranges. Is that going to be a big problem, Harvey? Don't like oranges. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's wonderful news. <laughs> if you suffer from migraines or even just headaches, avoiding these foods might help you. And in Harvey's case, Lucy also wants him to cut out all foods with additives. What we often find is things like ham or hot dogs can cause problems in some people, and it's because of the preservatives. And this is the trouble with a lot of the foods that you can't have. It's not the food itself, it's the things that have been used to preserve it or to make it taste better. Right. <laughs> and that's why they become a problem. Lucy also wants to boost Harvey's intake of three key vitamins. Although they are found in some foods, to get close to the right quantity, he would need to eat, for example, five kilos of lamb's liver a day. That's ten times what's on this plate and would contain dangerous levels of vitamin A. So Lucy is prescribing food supplements with the dosage approved by Great Ormond Street Hospital. One of which is magnesium, mm -hmm. which is a mineral, another of which is vitamin B2, and another one is coenzyme Q10. And it's thought that if you have small amounts of all of those taken in as supplements, that actually that can help migraines as well because of, of the way that they act in the brain. I found it really interesting, especially about the milk. Some of the foods, like the hot dogs, he does tend to like his hot dogs, so, um, hot dogs. yeah, That's so he won't be able to have them. Yeah. I'm going to go now. <laughs> <laughs> it's nearly three weeks since the food hospital gave Lauren her hormone-balancing food plan to try to help her polycystic ovary syndrome. I don't eat crisps or chocolate anymore, whereas I used to eat them... I used to eat crisps, like, every day, five days a week, and then chocolate on a weekend. As well as totally changing her eating habits, Lucy also prescribed daily exercise. The dancing makes me happy because it, it kind of reminds me of childhood, you know. It was a time I enjoyed was going to my disco dancing classes. Lauren, however, still feels unconfident and hardly leaves the house, but her boyfriend, Paul, supports her wholeheartedly. I don't give monkeys what, I, what anybody else thinks. <laughs> now, to me, she is a princess to me. Personally, I think she's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of things, a lot of dreams that we've both got. We both like to have a family of our own. Lauren, I know she'll be a great mum. I mean, really, we're, we're, we're the perfect couple. It's just that one little bit, I think, that's the missing bit of it. The next patient may look like an ordinary man, but he has been diagnosed with the fifth biggest killer illness in the world. My name's Chris Wilde. I'm 44. I uh, come from Sawtree in Cambridge here. Like 5% of the population, Chris has type 2 diabetes. Unlike type 1 diabetes, which is more unusual, type 2 is nearly always caused by diet. Symptoms can include feeling tired, more thirsty, frequent urination, genital itching and altered vision. When I was diagnosed, the doctor was very plain with me and said, you're, you're, you're sort of facing a, a lifelong condition. And that's, that's a real big sort of uh, kick. Type 2 diabetes is caused by too much glucose in your blood. This happens when the pancreas, which produces insulin, starts to fail. In a healthy body, the glucose in the bloodstream, seen here in green, is absorbed by the body's cells and converted to energy. But with diabetes, there is a problem with the insulin, which stops the glucose being absorbed. 
This leads to an excess of glucose in the bloodstream, which can start a chain of serious illnesses. Divorced Chris, who works in IT, spends most of his life on the road, grabbing his meals on the run. You pull into a petrol station and, um, you know, you'll typically grab anything. Sausage roll, crisps, whatever, and away you go. And of course, you're sat there doing nothing. So it's almost like a double whammy. You're, you're eating d dreadful food and you, you're not actually exercising yourself. Chris was diagnosed over two years ago, but ignored worrying symptoms until it was too late. I had uh, an operation last year. Um, it was a circumcision. And um, I found out through becoming ill, as it were in quotes, that there is a condition called phimosis. Phimosis is a painful condition where high sugar levels in the blood lead to contracting and splitting of the foreskin. It's painful and you have to have an operation to get rid of it. And that is, yeah, that's a direct result of diabetes. It does make me wonder why on earth I didn't stop at that point and start eating lettuce. At the moment, Chris is on three different drugs and faces a lifetime on medication. But it's his 17-year-old son, Vincent, who has made him face the music. The thought of my son seeing me dying because of this um, is frightening, to be honest. He's uh, pretty much the only person that's always there for me, so if he wasn't there, <laughs> life would be very hard. Looking for a second chance, Chris has come to see consultant surgeon Shaw Summers. Do you have any symptoms at all at the moment? Yeah, I have... Uh tingling in my toes. And Sometimes toe. the diabetes can affect your nerves, the nerves in your toes, what we call a peripheral neuropathy. And that unfortunately is what it looks like when the blood vessels are fully sealed off and furred up, toes start to die off and you have the start of what we call end organ damage. Now if you imagine that kind of thing happening to your kidneys, your heart, your eyes, that's diabetes, and once you've got that, it is irreversible. Um, <clears throat> well, it's shocking. Yeah. If your internal organs are going like that, that's, that's going to be catastrophic. Sorry to shock you about it, but that's the truth, and you need to know it, because diabetes is such an easy illness to have, if you like, because you don't know it's doing the damage until it's too late, Chris. Now, you have got a lot of weight to lose. You weigh 24 stone, and although you're a really tall chap, you need to be well under 20 stone. Now, just to illustrate how much weight you've got to lose, now, four stone is 12 of those. And that's five pounds of fat. I can't believe that. I cannot believe 12 of these. 12 of those that they're going to kill you. Weight loss will help clear the fat within Chris's pancreas and improve his insulin function. But he must act fast to avoid irreversible damage. So Shaw is prescribing a radical six-week plan based on a recent trial at Newcastle University. You were going to get you to an 800 calorie diet. Now the only real way to do that is to go to meal replacement. So you'll be having one of these instead of each meal and then we're going to add in some non-starchy vegetables to just give a bit of flavour, a bit of bulk and a bit of fibre to your diet. That will also help prevent too much hunger. Do you want to try that? Okay. On this plan, Chris will be allowed just three nutritionally complete drinks a day. What do you think? It's all right, actually. It tastes better than my foot's going to feel. <laughs> it's going to say it tastes better than your foot. <laughs> The standard treatment for type 2 diabetes could be a lifetime on medication. This would help the symptoms, but not cure the condition. But Shaw believes that under strict medical supervision, it could be reversed with food. 10% of the NHS budget is spent on treating diabetes and its complications. That's over £5 billion a year. 90% of patients are diabetic because of their weight and their eating habits. And if we can change those, we will save the healthcare economy an immense amount of money. But will the man who currently consumes 5,000 calories a day manage to survive on less than a sixth of his usual intake? Diabetes sucks. Kristen is 25 years old. 
Two years ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, which had already spread to her spine. Being so young, her case was incredibly rare. The statistics are not great when it comes to secondary breast cancer, but I beat the statistics in getting the disease. I can beat the statistics in fighting it and kind of kicking it to the curb. She's been battling it on all fronts, with a mastectomy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy and even food. Now she's founded her own charity targeting young people. We're Copperfield, we're a breast cancer awareness charity. Okay. We're making sure that people are checking themselves regularly and know the signs and symptoms of breast cancer. Beside her throughout her ordeal has been her identical twin sister, Maren. Hi. Um, the chickpea chowder, has that got dairy in it? Like so many of us, when faced with a daunting situation, they turn to the internet and books for help. It was really important that she kept, you know, she had to keep her energies up and, you know, to for the chemotherapy in particular, she had to put her body in a really good place. From the many theories linking food and cancer, the twins then adopted a totally new eating plan to try together. I think this is still a path of discovery for both of us. And if there's something that she should be doing to prevent her ever getting cancer, then obviously we want to know about it. When it comes to food and illness, it's tempting to self-prescribe from all the apparently harmless information available. But without medical supervision, a dramatic change in your diet can be very risky. So Kristen and Maren want to see what the food hospital has to say about their cancer-fighting diet. We want to know that we are doing the right thing. Um, and if there's anything else that we could be doing, then we want to know about it. Someone is diagnosed with cancer every two minutes in the UK. Kristen was unusually young to get breast cancer, but it is actually the most common cancer diagnosed in this country. All women should check their breasts regularly. You should look out for unfamiliar pain or discomfort on one side, changes to your breast size or shape, new lumps in your breast or armpit, and puckering or changes in the skin or nipple. The food hospital has studied the sisters' diets and wants to tell them about the latest scientific research on food and cancer. Kristen, Marin, you're both here today because one of you has breast cancer. And that's you, Kristen. Yes. It took eight months to pick up because I was too young, apparently, to get breast cancer. So by the time it was diagnosed, it had already spread to my spine. What kind of treatment have you had? The tumour in my breast was the size of an avocado and it needed to be a plum size. Um, I had to have five months of chemotherapy, quite aggressive chemotherapy. And so finally it was the right size to be operated and then I had a mastectomy. So tell us about what you guys have done diet-wise. I chose to not eat dairy and not eat meat. And what's your reasoning behind not eating those foods? My breast cancer is hormone sensitive. So I know that um, any oestrogen in my body could potentially feed the cancer. So I've decided to cut it out of my diet completely. I think it's a real empowering thing for a woman when you've got cancer to be able to have control over something. Mm -hmm. And that's how diet must feel. The twins decided to replace dairy with soya after reading about a theory linking breast cancer with the oestrogen found in cow's milk. This came from research showing that countries like China and Japan, with mostly dairy-free diets, have far lower breast cancer statistics. So we've got the dairy and the soya argument, and there is a lot of conflicting evidence about that. I mean, although there is a hypothesis about why dairy would increase cancer risk, when they've looked at it, they haven't found a link. I think it's entirely up to you whether you choose to have dairy or, or soya. As long as you're having calcium in rich soya to make sure that you don't damage your bones by not getting in enough calcium. So there's currently no proven link between breast cancer and dairy. But what about the twins' decision to stop eating meat? In breast cancer, the biggest studies so far haven't shown a link with meat. But we know actually saturated fat might have an impact on breast cancer risk. And certainly being overweight does. In fact, scientific evidence shows there are only three main factors which conclusively link lifestyle and cancer, smoking, excessive alcohol and obesity. Experts think that 25% of all cancers are caused by unhealthy diets and obesity. So by making healthy changes to your diet, we can also hopefully reduce your risk of getting cancer in the first place. While there's a lack of proof to support Kristen and Maren's choice of foods to avoid, they have made some positive additions. 
so absolutely it's right we can't cure cancer with diet we can't but there is some evidence to suggest the best sort of cancer prevention diet is a Mediterranean diet which from your food diaries I would say both of you pretty much fall into lots of fresh fruit and vegetables nuts and seeds olive oil and not having a lot of saturated fat I'm Dr. Pixie McKenna, and I'm investigating the truth about superfoods. So far, we know the name is a marketing invention which boosts sales, but are we actually buying a guarantee of better health? To find out if there really is any credible evidence behind these so-called superfoods, I've come to the Department of Food and Nutritional Science at Reading University. Blueberries are often reported to be one of the most popular superfoods, with sales rocketing from 1,000 to 15,000 tonnes a year in just over a decade. So I'm basing my research on them. One of their many health claims is that they contain flavonoids, which can lower blood pressure. So I want Professor Jeremy Spencer to put this to the test. So this is the real deal. This, this is the science behind This the is health. the hard science, yes. OK. The red and blue bits indicate blood flow. So what we're seeing here is, in your normal relaxed situation, the blood flow is pulsing through nicely, your heart rate is normal. Jeremy then gives me a big glass of blueberry juice. That's two punnets worth. This large amount is to show a big difference in a short time, and 90 minutes later, he measures my veins again. What you can see here is an actual increase in the size of the vessel. I can tell you now that it looks much better than it did earlier. Those beneficial flavonoids within the blueberry have been absorbed into your bloodstream and they've caused the release of a compound called nitric oxide which causes the dilation of your blood vessels and therefore lowers your blood pressure. So there is scientific proof that with enough blueberries you can lower your blood pressure. But is it unique in this property? Jeremy is testing blackberries alongside the superfood to see if they contain the same key flavonoids. They're very similar in that they've both turned blue, and this is an indication that both of them contain those same beneficial compounds. What that means is if we'd chosen to feed you uh, blackberry instead of blueberry, we should have seen similar effects on um, your artery function. In fact, Jeremy's team have proven that these beneficial flavonoids are also found in lots of other fruits, including raspberries, blackcurrants, redcurrants and plums. So they are by no means exclusive to blueberries. Do you think it's really helpful to call food a superfood? Personally, I don't. By singling out individual ones as superfoods, we give um, consumers the impression that they should only be eating these, and it's probably more to do with commercial interests rather than encouraging us to eat fruits and vegetables. So there you go. The scientists are saying there's no real evidence to suggest that there is such a thing as a superfood, if by that we mean a single food that will help stave off illness or keep us healthy. It's three weeks since the food hospital prescribed Harvey his strict elimination plan to try and beat his constant migraines. To Sophie, have a wonderful birthday. Today, it's Harvey's little sister's birthday party. While the other children tuck into crisps and cakes, Harvey mustn't eat any food that may contain additives. Since coming back from the food hospital, things have been a little bit stressful. It's been hard trying to make sure I get all the right things in um, so that I know that he's eating something he should be all the time. So Mum Louise is making him some party food of his own. But for a seven-year-old boy, it's tough being the odd one out. Party food, everybody allows it except for me because I'll get headaches, migraines, or should I say. And for a mum who's lost three years to Harvey's migraines, she still worries that his food plan won't work. That is homemade fish finger. I'm still on edge waiting you know, waiting for something to happen. Um, you know, I'm waiting for him to have a migraine, which is awful to say, but because he's had so many, I'm waiting for him to have one. It's 12 weeks since 24-year-old Lauren came to the food hospital with polycystic ovary syndrome. Now, like all food hospital patients, she has returned for her final consultation. 
Gio and Lucy want to know if her hormone balancing food plan has helped her symptoms. So Lauren, it's been nearly 12 weeks since we first met. How have things been going? Um, they've been going really well, actually. And I can see a visible difference. You've clearly lost weight. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you look really well. You know you've lost 10 kilos. Yeah. Which I... in English is about a stone and a half, by the way. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I'm seriously impressed. Thank you. <laughs> Previously, you had had a very irregular or even absent menstrual cycle. How has that been? Since I've been on this plan, it's been relatively regular, actually. I haven't missed any. That is a really encouraging sign, I think, which suggests that the PCOS isn't as severe. Have you noticed any benefits? I've noticed that my hirsutism is not growing back as quickly or as coarse as it was before, so less for me to take care of. Less pruning required? Oh, yes, definitely. I feel less like a conifer now. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. I actually went swimming for the first time in... 10 years uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> that's a really big step for somebody that's not feeling body confident. Mm. Lauren's treatment plan appears to have lowered her insulin levels, which has led to improved physical symptoms and given her confidence a huge boost. I think um, I'm going to try and make swimming a regular thing. It's definitely part of a new me. Um, as much as I love the dancing, it's great to do it at home, but I also need to branch out and start going out a bit more, I think. The one thing that hasn't changed is Lauren's testosterone levels. This could mean that her high testosterone wasn't caused by diet, so she's been referred for further investigations, but Lauren remains undaunted. Um, having kids um, in the future does feel a lot more achievable. Because as I progress with this, you know, my weight will go lower and I'll get healthier and, <laughs> and it'll hopefully improve my fertility. So it's looking a lot more bright on that front. So food treatment has helped with Lauren's problem. But what will the results show for Chris's type 2 diabetes and seven-year-old Harvey's migraines when they return to the food hospital? The food hospital uses pioneering research into food as medicine to treat real people and report the results, whatever the outcome. Twelve weeks ago, seven-year-old Harvey came with Mum Louise, hoping for a cure for his agonising migraines. What's this one here? I want to be killed. I want to be killed. Since then, his mum's done her best to keep him on his migraine trigger elimination plan. Now Lucy and Gio want to know if it's worked. Welcome back, Harvey and Louise. <laughs> Hello. Tell us what's happened since we last saw you. Since we started the new diet, he's been absolutely fine. We've had nothing. Um, that's amazing. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. so impressed. It was pretty much straight away. It's amazing that his migraines have all but disappeared. Definitely. Even in the first week, he hadn't even had one. And, and before we started the diet, he was still having three or four a week. So, astonishing. So, yeah, to have that work so Almost quickly. Almost instantaneous yeah, resolution. It, it, was, it was fantastic. Over the summer holidays, Louise had complete control of Harvey's food. But on his return to school, his diet slipped, which led to some minor headaches. We've just had a couple in the last week or so, um, but we think that's due to him being at school, so we've addressed that now, and since we've addressed it, he's, he's been fine again. The fact that Harvey only got headaches when he didn't follow his food plan makes it less likely that the extraordinary results are due to a placebo effect. What have his drawings been like recently? We've got... Um, a man surfing, a little note to say that he loves me. <laughs> Got a big love heart. That's nice. And Aww. a picture of him in his school uniform with a big smiley, smiley face. <laughs> Harvey, you've been feeling better? Yes. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's really good. I still now think, oh, you know, is he going to trip? Is it, you know, is something going to happen? But it's, it's been really good, so... Um, Nothing's going to happen to me. No. Good. That's <laughs> really good. This is an amazing outcome for the food hospital. The results from our food therapy have been almost instantaneous, going from up to five migraines a week down to two minor headaches in three months. And that was only when they couldn't stick to the plan. Just shows how powerful those changes have been. While Harvey's been following a food elimination plan, Chris is existing on low-calorie meal replacements 
in a dramatic bid to conquer his type 2 diabetes. You expect to go, ooh, but actually, it's all right. This extreme 800 calorie a day allowance means Chris can only have three of the prescribed drinks plus a small helping of vegetables. In terms of the sort of effects, I've hit every single possible symptom, you know, tiredness, dizziness. He has, like, lost a lot of energy, and, like, just sort of does one thing. And then I'm flat, completely flat. And, yes, there have been testing times, I have to say. Shaw gave him just six weeks to bring his diabetes out of the danger zone before the damage became irreversible. I've got a couple of pictures on my phone, which are horrific. They look like they've come from a horror film. They haven't. They're just pictures that have been taken of people with diabetes. Diabetes sucks. It really does. Chris may have found a way to stay focused, but only his return visit to the food hospital will reveal whether Shaw's radical strategy will be enough to save his life. Welcome back to the food hospital, Chris. Now, I can tell you that having done your diet for six weeks, you've lost a massive two and a half stone. That's an incredible result by any measure. And you've lost eight of those. <laughs> and as a result, your body's insulin will be much more effective. How do you feel? <laughs> a lot lighter, <laughs> as to be said. When Chris first came to the food hospital, his blood sugar reading was 8.5, which is dangerously diabetic. He's been testing it daily throughout his treatment, and it has been falling consistently. 3.9, that's a really good reading. That's at the lower end of the normal range, and your current readings show that actually you're well on the way to going into remission. That is, um, wow, that is amazing. <laughs> Chris can now start eating again on a low-calorie diet to continue his weight loss and hopefully be free of diabetes. From our point of view, the most important thing is that we'll have given your son his dad back. Yeah. Someone who wants to be the dad that he needs. Mm. Of course, I feel fantastic about it. You know, it, uh, I just feel better. Yeah, and as far as my son's concerned, having done the diet, hopefully I have a lot more, lot more time with him, and also be a lot more able as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, good. It's a huge result. It's been very difficult to follow, but it's just opened my eyes really to what what's possible. This is fantastic news for Chris and the food hospital. In just six weeks, his life-threatening condition has been reversed simply by using food as medicine.